that just amazes me is that as a, as a leader of this ministry, um, you know, obviously God has shown me where this place is, where this is going to end up. And it's, be, it's far beyond. It's so great that I end up having issues sleeping sometimes because I want to get there so fast. Amen. Ah, and sometimes we run when we should walk. Amen. And, 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 and you learn this in school in the hallway, you should walk because there's dangers if you run and you're not careful. Amen. Amen. And so it's just, I see the movement. I see the, the growth. I see what he's doing. There's things that he has to, to do in our ministry. There's things he has to do in our lives. And he's putting the pieces together. Ah, can y'all imagine? A church without all the pieces, but a multitude of people. Fragmented churches trying to make people whole. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And what God is showing me is that I got you. There's pieces that I'm putting together. And when those pieces are together, the multitude will come. And so as a leader, it's hard for me to, to be patient. Because I want the multitude to come. I want the greatness that has shown me. But at the end of the day, I have to stay at his feet. Just be still. And don't be God. Amen. Amen. Oh, well. mm. oh, all right. Well, today, we're, we're wrapping up the series of Nehemiah. Guys, this been, it's a third, it was supposed to be 13 weeks, but we had hurricanes and all this other stuff. And it kind of pushed us back a few weeks. But it's all right, because I'm here to tell you, God knows what he's doing in everything that happens. And, and when you guys see what we're talking about today, and, and I'll explain some things so you'll see exactly what I mean by that. But we're going to read, if you guys want to stand with me as we read the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13, verse 4 through 11. And I'll give you a moment to get there. Verse 4 through 11. Yeah, let me get an amen. Good. Amen. amen. It says, Before this, Elijah the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to, to store the grain offering and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, gatekeepers as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here, I learned about the evil thing Elijah had done in providing to buy a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobias household goods, I'm sorry, and threw all of Tobias household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God, with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions of science of the Levites had not been given to them, and that all of the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. And so I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? And then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. Whew. Most righteous Father, we come before you today, Lord. We are so grateful for this time of fellowship. Thank you for your presence today, Father. We know that you're here. Hallelujah. Your children can sense your presence. Amen. And so, Lord, we are just so grateful that you're here. I pray right now, Father, that in the midst of all of my imperfections and in the midst of all of my insufficiencies, Lord, your word will go forward perfectly. And that everyone's heart in here, Father, will receive it exactly the way you want them to receive it so that transformation can take place in their lives. Hallelujah. I include myself in that as well. And that is my prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. So we started this Nehemiah walk, and it was supposed to be 13 weeks, and in the perfect 
world, it would be exactly 13 weeks. But as we all know, some things happened. You know, with you know, we had to close church down on one, I think it was one or two Sundays, and then last Sunday we were in a different church having worship. And so it kind of pushed things back a little bit. Um, but today's title for this message is called Cover Me. Cover Me. And the reason why God gave me that title is because when I look at chapter 13 and how the issues came about, and I also look at where we are today. Now watch this. In the past few days, I have had several conversations in where a leader was expected to be in position to cover someone, and they weren't. I'm one of them where a leader was expected to be in position to cover someone, but they weren't. And that's, it, it was several, when I say several, I'm talking about from like Wednesday through yesterday. I've had several conversations with different people who were in position or who were victimized because they felt like they should have been, and rightfully so, but yet the person that was supposed to cover them did not. And so now as I read back through the book of Nehemiah, it caused me to alter some things in my message because I see that there is a need in the house of God for protection. Whew. God is showing me that there is a need for protection in the house of God. Oftentimes we look at covering as paying bills or making sure our, we have food on the table and food in the refrigerator and when we look at it from a worldly standpoint, it says, I do cover those who I'm in charge of, but those are natural things. Anybody can do that, whether they're a believer or not. Is that true? Amen. Amen. But on a spiritual level, there's a level of coverage that we all need and that we all should be able to give that the average ordinary Joe cannot offer. So what does it mean to cover? It means to protect. It means to care for. It also means to make sure that nothing is lacking spiritually first and then physically and emotionally. So we have to be particular about the things God has given us to manage because the enemy does come to steal, kill, and destroy. So now we're looking at Nehemiah, a man of God who heard clearly from God on this entire project. We went all through the chapters. And we saw that he knew, he had a relationship with God that was clear. And he did exactly what God has called him to do. Because if he didn't, it wouldn't have been reestablished. When God calls you to something, it will be seen through to completion. And if he didn't, come on somebody, y'all already know, you won't finish it. No matter how much you want to do it, no matter how much you got in you to finish it, but if God didn't call you to do it, you won't finish it. There was a, I think it was chapter 11. Or maybe he has 11. Chapter 11, they cast lots. All right? Because they had all these people that was around to help rebuild it. But Nehemiah said, I can't keep all of y'all here. God is telling me to get rid of them and trim the fat. And we talk about trim the fat. And, and so they cast lots. And he only kept one out of every ten. The other nine went back home. So as a leader, when you trust God to trim the fat, it's very easy for you to let your guard <laughs> And this is what he did. And so he let his guard down after the fat was trimmed because he was expecting everyone in his circle to be exactly who God called to be there in his circle. How many of y'all know it only takes one person to destroy something that God has established? So one out of ten may not seem like a lot, but it only takes one person to tear down something that has been built up. And so Nehemiah, with his guard down, he said, I'm, I'm ready to leave the work that God has called me to do to go back to my job as a cupbearer. So let's get this. God called him to build Jerusalem and to govern it. But because everything was back up and running, he let his guard down and went back to being a cop. He left the walls of Jerusalem and left. Come on, y'all gotta get this. He left the ministry that God gave him and went back 
to what he was doing before God gave him the ministry. This happens so often. And when he left, because his guard was down, his discernment was down. His discernment was down. And so what he did was he selected someone who is known as a high priest. Someone who was known as a high priest. So he didn't use the sermon, he used the title to position somebody in a place they shouldn't have been. Ah, oh boy. So let's, let's just be clear about this. The fact that Elijah, who was a high priest, the fact that he was involved and he was part of the one out of the ten that they kept, it doesn't mean that he snuck by God. Okay, let's be clear. He didn't sneak by God. He didn't pull one over on anybody. But how many of you know sometimes God will allow the enemy to remain in your camp just to show them that my God is greater? Amen. God will allow you to continue to build even with the enemy being in your camp because he knows that at the end of the day that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Even if the weapon is Pat me on the back the whole way. Y'all gotta get that experience. <laughs> oh man. Thank you, Jesus. We've all gone through that at some point in time in our life, though, where we share our innermost secrets with people. The person that we befriended for whatever reason, and we share those secrets that we want to share with anybody else. And they're absorbing all that information. They're taking it all in. Meanwhile, they're they're over here just building up this big old weapon against you. You don't even know it. He's smiling in your face, patting you on the back, and sharpening the knife to stab you at all the same time. That's what a lot of shit was doing. But think about it for a minute. He was with them from the beginning, helping them to build. He was with them from the very beginning, helping them to build. If you go back to what chapter 2, I believe it is, you'll be able to see where it talks about the high priest, Elisha, brought his people in and helped them build. And they were in charge of a certain section, and they got that part going. Mm -hmm. Help them build. <sighs> so often we pour out to people, not even realizing that the whole time they're with us building, that they're actually plotting against us. So Nehemiah, oh yeah, he chose Elisha to take charge, which to the naked eye and without discernment, it sounds like the right thing to do because he is known as a high priest. Why not leave a high priest in charge of the ministry? He's well respected throughout all the different nations because of everything that he has done and accomplished. He was well respected. And plus, he was with him from day one. You know, a lot of times we like to say, oh, he's with me with some, you know, from day one. That's my day one homie, so yeah, I got you. I'm putting you in the spot. You know how it is. That's, that's the reality. And so that's what I believe happened with Nehemiah. Because if you look at Elisha's name, his name means the God of conversation. Red flag number one, he calls himself a God. Oh, oh yeah. See, there's a lot of things that we miss if we're not careful. His name means God of conversation. So that's the first red flag. The second red flag is he's a master of conversation. He's a sweet talker, a smooth talker. Come on, somebody. He knows how to talk himself in and out of situations. He knows how to connive his words to get what it is he wants. And he made it all the way to the level of a high priest being a smooth talker. Mm. And it also makes us wonder how he was chosen by Nehemiah. I'm pretty sure he got in Nehemiah's ear and had some things to say to him and probably ran his resume down to him really well. Have you seen this is what I've accomplished? This is what I've done in my life. Why not me? The God of conversation. He's just really trying to put it in there. But I mean, I know sometimes the most obvious choice is not always the best choice. You can ask David. Think about David for a minute, the youngest, the smallest, the little scrawny brother out of all the other muscular brothers when they were coming and looking for somebody <coughs> to take charge. They saw it after all the big boys. And they forgot all about David. The most obvious choice would have been David's big brothers, but the right choice was not David's big brothers, it was David. 
So often we want to choose and appoint people because of their resume and their desires, but we overlook the heart of the person. You may be qualified for the job, but are you qualified for the call? It's a difference. Your fire will always speak louder than your experience. Amen. I don't care how many churches you've served in. I don't care how many years you've known God. I don't care how many people you've ministered to and saved. But if your fire is on zero, I can't use you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I said, I don't care how many people you've saved. I don't care how many churches you've ministered into. I don't care any about any of that stuff. All of those things, how many lives you've changed, how many years you've been in church, how many years you've been saved. I don't care about none of that stuff, but if your fire is on zero, I cannot help you. You cannot help me. Mm. Your fire will always supersede your experience. Oh, Jesus. Your fire will always supersede your experience. I'll take the person that says, I have no experience, but I really and truly have a burning desire to do this. I will take that person any day of the week. Then the other person that says, look at my resume, and start running pages after pages after pages. But then when I say it's time to get to work, they know where to be found. Amen. Oh, come on, man. Can't build a ministry that way. So here we are. Ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. You can't just put anybody in charge of anything that's important to God. Now look at Tobiah. This is the one who is related to Elijah, right? Watch this. In chapter 3, verse 1, Tobiah was the very first person to rise up against Nehemiah. He was the first person to rise up against Nehemiah. But now watch this. Watch how funny this is, y'all. Tobiah's name means the Lord is good. <laughs> so he is identified with the name saying the Lord is good, but yet still he was the first person to rise up to try to shut the church down. Ah. This is why we have to use discernment in order to cover the things of God effectively. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We have to use discernment because without discernment, this is how I would look. I would look at his name, look at what he's known as. He's like, your name means the Lord is good. You would be perfect to lead our worship team because you would be able to get people to worship saying the Lord is good. You're Elijah. You are a high priest. You have all these accolades. You would be perfect to lead the church because of his title. See, there we're looking at titles and accolades instead of looking at the heart of the person. Amen. Ah. This is where a lot of churches miss it, y'all. Y'all got to get this. This is why a lot of churches miss it, and people end up wounded, and ended up hurt, and end up leaving churches because they have allowed the wrong person to lead something, and that person ends up wounding the people that's following. No discernment. So discernment. It doesn't only serve as correction for others, but it also serves as protection to ourselves. Men and women of God, when we abandon our post, and then going back to Nehemiah, he abandoned his post to go back to do worldly things, and it left the church vulnerable. Now I'm going to switch it around to us. When we abandon our post and our loved ones, who and what we are called to cover and protect, those very things will come under attack. So if I'm called to cover this church, if I abandon the church, the church will come under attack. I'm called to cover my wife. If I don't cover her, she will come under attack. Same with my children. Same with the community. Whoever God has called me to cover or called you to cover, if you abandon hope for any reason, the enemy will come in and attack. You could be the nicest person in the whole world. Come on, somebody. You can do everything that you think is right. I help this person. I help that person. I'm always looking to bless other people. 
But if you're not at your post, the enemy is coming after you. Amen. And that's what happened with Nehemiah. He was at his post the entire time. The enemy was there, but the enemy had no authority to move okay. because Nehemiah was still in position. Okay. Amen. Uh, okay. You got to get that. And so it wasn't until Nehemiah left his post that the enemy had space to operate. So this is a wake-up call for all of us. And I'll start with us as men. How well do we cover our wives? Our wives are, are God's gift to us. That's our first ministry. It's our first ministry. We're, we're called to carry the cross. And carrying the cross means we're carrying burdens and carrying all the weight that comes with being a husband, the way that God has called us to be. That's our cross. Without the cross, there's no ministry. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Amen. Marriage is a ministry, but if you're not carrying the cross, you're not ministering to your wife. This is good. So watch this. <laughs> oh, Lord, he, he's, he's, man, I want to turn with you guys. I want y'all to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. This is something that I, that I was exposed to a couple days ago. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. This is important. We're talking about coverage. We're talking about protection. The way God wants us to do it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. It says, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, now we gotta we gotta we gotta play with that for a minute. Because we've heard the scripture a million times. We've heard it time and time again, but we gotta play with this thing, see the spot that he's talking about that he wants to be rid of, that is the blemishes on the surface. And I just, I just, this was given to me, I just learned this literally a couple of days ago. The spot represents the blemish. See, when God gives us our wife, there's some things that we recognize off the bat that obviously is maybe, if you want to call it a flaw or whatever, that God has to work on. There are some things that are obvious up front, but yet we still say yes anyway, amen? That is the spot that we're talking about. Our job is to wash her with the word to get rid of that spot. Amen. We start talking about the wrinkle, the blemish. And this is a beautiful analogy. I, I love it, so I have to share this with you guys. You think about buying fruit. When you're out there, you, you see the fruit stain, you look at that fruit, you're searching for spots. You're searching for any defect that you can see physically. See, that's the, that's the spot. If you see the spot, you know there's an issue with the fruit. But the wrinkle on the skin, the wrinkle on the skin signifies that there is decay on the inside. Oh, that's so deep. I just, I, I was mind blown when I got that. It is, the wrinkle represents decay on the inside. So you may not see all of the stuff that your wife is bringing into the marriage. You see the spot, but you may not see the wrinkle. But at the end of the day, when we say, I do, our job is to wash our wives with the word of God so that way the spot that we see and the wrinkles that we don't see all becomes clean under God. Oftentimes we get railroaded by the wrinkle and then we're ready to give up and throw in the towel. Y'all ain't that. Y'all ain't that when you get the car. That's all right. <laughs> we, we, we say I do because we see the spot, but we didn't say I do to the wrinkle, the stuff that's inside that we don't know anything about until after we start spending day in and day out. I don't want to get nobody in trouble, amen. <laughs> amen. We see the spot. Amen. I got you covered. I got you covered. Don't worry. Hey, we're not off the hook either, amen. <laughs> we're not off the hook, but that's what I'm trying to say. So we say I do to the spot. But we have no idea what is going on with the ring. We don't know what's the, the innermost, the intrinsic stuff. We have no idea what that's all about. But God is saying, once you say I do, your job is to wash your wife with the word. So that there be no spot 
and no greater. So he's telling us that his word is strong enough to break whatever stronghold you might have found underneath the wrinkle. I don't care what it is. Amen? Amen. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Wives, cover your husbands. Cover your husbands. While we're carrying our cross, are you strengthening us? Or are you adding weight? This is a question. In Proverbs 31, chapter 11 and 12, I'm sorry, verses 11 and 12, I'm going to have you all over the place. Proverbs 31, verse 11 and 12, it says, Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Mm -hmm. Are you bringing your husband good? Mine is. Nobody else got to say that. So they quiet over there. Mine is. Amen. Amen. Mine is bringing you plenty good. Amen. Amen. Does mine give me confidence? Mine does. It's yours. Yes, yes. She should bring confidence. Because if you're not bringing him good, you're not bringing him confidence. And without confidence, men will be in lack in everything that we do. The closest relationship we'll have aside from God is with our spouse. That's the first physical, tangible relationship we have outside of a spiritual relationship with God. So if we're not being given confidence from that first responder, so to speak, then we're going to be in lack of everything we put our hands to. That's what the word is saying. Confidence is not gained. I'm sorry. Confidence is gained. It's not assumed. Okay? So what that says is it has to be worked at. It's only gained through assurance in the midst of uncertainties. And so please cover your husbands as husbands should be covering their wives. And if you're not married, what has God entrusted you with? Who has God entrusted you with? If it's not family, do you have friends, neighbors, relatives? What about the church? How can you cover your church? Now, this is a, co this is a, a collective question. Do you pray for your pastor daily? Amen. Amen. Do you pray for the ministry daily? See, these are these are covering type questions. Are you covering the ministry that God has sent you to? And it's not about money. It's not about anything else. But it's but prayer. Yes. Do you pray for his family? Have you found a way that you can seal any leaks that may be in the ministry so that way the enemy cannot come in? This is how we cover the things that God has given to us. If we take it lightly, we'll have Elijah in our camp. We'll have Tobiah in our camp. Moving and activating freely because there's nobody there to stop. So God is saying in this season, although it is time for us to move, we also have to make sure that we're covering. As the enemy shoots his fiery darts, if we don't have a shield up to cover, we'll get hit. Now I understand that there's going to be times when we feel like we're strong enough to withstand certain things, but understand this one thing, if you do not have someone covering you in prayer, if you do not have someone covering you in any other fashion, spiritually, at some point, your weaponry will wear down. I can believe God to do anything. But God uses his people also to cover his people. Amen. He's a great delegate. That's what he does. I can do all of this, but I'm going to empower you to do it. So now that he has empowered us to do it, if we're not doing our job, we're leaving leaks in the ministry. Yeah. We're leaving the body exposed to the attacks of the enemy. And so today, it's about coverage. 
Think about your personal life. Who do you have in your life that you can call on for prayer daily? That you can just say, pray with me this morning. Or pray for me this morning. Do you have that person that you can call on daily? That you can say, pray for me or pray with me. And it goes down, I got you. Let's go. Father, in the name of Jesus, and you're going after it, and you're covered. Amen. Or do you just pray for yourself and say, that's enough? I'm here to simply tell you, isolation is one of the smoothest things <coughs> of the end. I feel like I'm righteous. I feel like God hears my prayers. My prayers are good enough. Yes, your, your prayers are righteous and they are heard. But let me tell you something. Intercessory prayer is the most powerful prayer there is. How else do we be saved? Amen. Intercessory prayer is what saved us. When he was on the cross, we weren't praying. The people that were stabbing him, though, they weren't praying. They had no, no whatsoever. They had no idea whatsoever what prayer was. They didn't care about it. It was the intercessor on the cross that got us to the place where we are today. Intercessory prayer is the most important prayer that we can have. And so if you don't have anyone that can intercede for you, that, that will intercede for you, that you can call them and say, pray for me. I know I'm going through something. Or pray for me. I got a few free minutes. I just want to pray. I just want to pray for somebody. Amen. So that, that's the Holy Spirit is moving because that's where I was going next. Because if you don't have anybody, that's going to say, raise your hand. Amen. Did you do that? Amen. My brother, you're covered. You're covered. Amen. In the name of Jesus, yes, you're covered. You. In the name of Jesus. I'll pray with you. Yes. Is there anybody else that says, oh, you too? Yes, <laughs> I'll pray with you too. <laughs> because y'all got to understand this whole thing, what God showed me in all of this is that we can get deep with the word and be able to read it frontwards, backwards, our eyes closed in our sleep and be able to interpret it left and right and do all these up and down things. I understand what I'm saying. But there's a level of coverage that we still need. I could be an amazing running back, but without blockers, I'm no good. Okay, True. Yeah. All right. Come on, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So God said, you can't do this by yourself, and I won't let you do it by yourself. That is why he gave us his word, and that's why it's so timely, because he allowed me to see for myself this past week the importance of it. He held us off to get to chapter 13, so after experiences had to come about, and people would call me and would talk and have these different comments about coverage, he held it off long enough to see it so that way we recognize the importance of coverage. We have to protect each other. There's a song, if I can find it, I'll play it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to find it now, I'll play it. Because it is so important that you guys recognize it. Just hit my spirit. I know this song. Y'all probably know it, too. It just hit my spirit. If you don't have it, is there